what age you before use? beauty, huh? And um, <laughs> the realtors, including an article on Western News for the Chronicle, and I didn't write down what page that was, but it's. Yes. He was also the cura curator of the Antique Photo Museum in Clayton, New York, and executive director at one time of the Alexandria Township Historical Society in Alexandria Bay, New York. Currently, he is uh, curating the Digital Museum, the Online Wooden Canoe Museum. But for his longtime passion, all things a better person to tell us about uh, the carpenter canoe, the rise and decline of the wooden canoe factory in North America. And this is like the rise and decline uh, afternoon here. <laughs> <laughs> so the wagons and now uh, the canoe. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. They both have a similar shape. That's the way I was thinking about yes, that yes. one. Uh, yes. the wagons. And now I'll give you it. I'll give you it. Okay. So yes, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the canoe factories in North America. And I thought maybe it would be important to start with is uh, what is a canoe? Because I think maybe everybody here probably thinks they know what a canoe is. You know, we also need to know why it matters. So broadly speaking, it's a narrow, open, lightweight craft that can be hewn from a log and may consist of a framework of bark, cloth, skin, and light wood. May be constructed of light metal or fiberglass. Used primarily on inland or sheltered waters for traveling, fishing, exploring, racing, and pleasure. They're generally sharp at each end and round bilged. May or may not have a keel. Most are open but may be decked with a small cockpit. Propelled and steered by a single or double bladed paddle. Held in a near vertical position without the use of a fixed fulcrum. The paddle is facing forward. Generally paddled by two people or solo, and it can also be sailed, sailed and may also have additional stabilizing devices. Now, this is a definition that was put together by the Mirror Museum Encyclopedic Work, the Actazumba, the Dictionary of the World's Watercraft. So, here's an example of a canoe. Maybe it's one that most of you are familiar with. There's another canoe. Those are my grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> and right after that, my grandfather dropped his keys in the water. <laughs> they still got married. Yeah. Now here's another canoe. This is what we generally call to what is it called a group paddling canoe or a war canoe. This is an example of a deck canoe. It's a young lady using a double-bladed paddle. Here's a canoe being sailed. And other forms of, of uh, sailing canoes. So with these all particularly dates of the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, we're generally used up in the northeast. This is not a canoe. This is what we would call a kayak. And the way you tell the difference between a canoe and a kayak is, is really very really simple. It's that you can get into a canoe, but you have to wear a kayak. <laughs> So why do they matter? Why, why am I here talking to you about canoes from the old days? Well, in uh, pre-contact time and in the early days of exploration, water was a major highway. It's how people got from place to place, how they transported goods, how they conducted warfare. And then in exploration and trade, in this example, we have the Hudson's Bay Fur Company sending birch bark canoe brigades out to collect furs and Great outposts in the wilderness. They were used for gathering food. In this example, they were gathering wild rice. And there were canoes that were specific shapes for collecting this wild rice. They were really used a lot for recreation. This photo is a scene on the Charles River in the 19-teens. And at times, this is the Charles River, this is right outside of Boston. And it was a real mecca for canoes and canoe uh, building. They had a number of canoe building shops along the river here. There were numerous canoe clubs and boat houses. And on Sunday afternoons, there could be as many as 6,000 canoes on a small two mile stretch of river. Uh, the American Canoe Association was founded in 1880, and their major uh, premise was uh, the idea of racing canoes 
and going canoe tripping. And so these are scenes from uh, some of their annual regattas back in the day, and much like the EA, IA has an annual meeting every year, the, the American Canoe Association had an annual meeting every year. And this is the, the group photo. Belisle, Michigan was another park that had a lot of canoe liveries and, and lots of activity and canoeing and boating. Used for romance. <laughs> Canoodling was a popular pastime. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, what I'm going to do is sort of take you through the indigenous roots of dugouts and birch bark canoes. Talk a little bit about the one-off handled canoes that developed from those, and then move into what it means to have uh, canoes built in a factory situation. So the dugout trip canoe is simply uh, felling a tree and hollowing out everything that doesn't look like a canoe. Very labor intensive, the canoes were very heavy. Typically they were made of um, basswood or elm, um, poplar. A uh, recent find in, in Michigan, started this particular example, is this the Lake Mendota, which is right at the capital of Madison, Wisconsin. Found in 2021, it's dated to 1,200 years old. And since then, they found another one that dates to 3,000 years ago. So canoes have been around for a long time. Bark canoes uh, were typically made uh, using the bark from the white birch tree or paper birch tree, fitted uh, with uh, ribs and sheathing made from riven uh, white cedar. They're built on the ground one at a time, and the process starts with folding the bark into roughly the shape of the canoe and staking it into place to form its shape. Uh, you can see that there's gores, these little diagonal slits that are cut into the, the bark so that it will fold up as it approaches the ends. And then the, the split planking is laid roughly inside the, the canoe, and then the ribs are heated up over an open fire, bent, and then inserted into place, and that holds everything together and strings and tightens up the bark on the hull and makes everything stiff. At one point, when bark was becoming more and more scarce, somebody started experimenting with using canvas as a replacement for the bark. And it was this innovation that sort of led one piece of the puzzle that led to the factorization of canoe construction. So we have uh, uniform materials, construction forms, and metal bands, and we're going to talk about those in a bit. So in 1875, John Henry Rushton uh, started a boat building factory, and at that time he was building what we call lap straight canoes. And this is where the cedar planking it's attached to the hull in such a way that it overlaps like the clapboards on a house. So each strake is, is overlaps and run through with uh, rivets or copper nails. They're built over this form you can see on the side. It's basically a bunch of station molds, the shape of the interior canoe. And the beauty of this is that once the, the boat comes off the form and you want to change to a different design, you just take those station molds off of the scrum back Stack them up in a pile and throw them up in the attic and get your next boat down and, and you have another design that you can build. Similarly, in, in Canada, in the Peterborough area, they're building uh, uh, canoes over solid molds. And this was another innovation. This whole process started with a dugout canoe. That they were racing dugout canoes at the time. There was a lot of work to do that. So somebody had a nice dugout canoe that was sort of wearing out, and they thought, well, I'll just build another canoe on top of that, using it as a perform. So what ultimately evolved from that is the construction of a solid form, which is usually made out of pine or basswood planking, over which the ribs of your canoe would be bent and held in place, and then your planking would be nailed through the plank, through the rib, and right into the form. And then while the planking is on, you pry it all off and over time, these grooves would grow in the form, and then you have to go back in the canoe afterwards and knock the points because they go through. You have to knock them all down and clinch them tight. In the 1870s, a fellow named Dan Harold patented an idea for a canoe mold, and 
the interesting thing was is that the canoes Dan Harold was famous for were a unique construction method yeah, where you had a thin layer of planking maybe four inches wide and a sixteenth of an inch thick. So going crosswise across, across the canoe, creating a solid surface, a layer of uh, white lead impregnated fabric was laid over that, and then the second layer of thin planking running longitudinally along the, along the canoe. We call that a double planked canoe. However, his patent was not for that idea of construction. His patent was for sheathing his form in steel. <laughs> so that when he pounded all these tacks into the form, that it would go through the, the planking of the canoe, hit the tip would hit the battle band, and turn the point around, automatically clenching the nail. <laughs> and then that sort of all led to the idea of the canvas covered canoe, which was really kind of developed in the main area, which we were for our meeting last year, where I was supposed to give this presentation originally, not in a canoe. <laughs> but I thought at this point it would be worthwhile for me to sort of go through many of the various parts of the canoe, so that as I talk about them later, you'll know what I'm referring to. So this is basically showing the complete process of building a canvas covered canoe. And it moves from the left side of the screen to the right. So here underneath, these are the bent ribs. And you can see underneath each of those bent ribs, there's a, a 18 or 20 gauge metal strip. And so if you bend the, and then you have the, the inner gunnel running the length of the canoe, which the ribs are nailed to as you bend, you bend the ribs over the form, you nail them to that gunnel, and then after the, your ribs are all done, you come along and you attach your planking. And again, the tacks are, are just about a sixteenth of an inch longer than the combined thickness of your ribbon plank, so it hits that metal band and it punches around. Your hull is completely covered up, you stretch your canvas fabric tightly lengthwise along the boat. Stretch it across the width of the boat and staple it or tack it to your, your rail. And so it's only fastened to the canoe along the rail and at the stem. The rest of it is just completely floating loose. Not loose, but it's floating on the canoe. We fill the canvas with a canvas stiller, which we experiment with various kinds, but the traditional canvas stiller from the 1880s on was a combination of quartz paint, white lead, and silica, real fine silica. And that creates a really smooth, really durable, mildew resistant surface, and then your final coat of paint to give it the, the finishing color. So, this is a, so again, here's an example of the canoe building form that was uh, from the Kennebec Canoe Company, which was in uh, Waterville, Maine. Again, you can see that the, the Oh, the metal bands are in place, there's no woodwork on this, and the stems are left wide open so that the steam bent stems will just hang off the end so that you can get the canoe off of the mold when it was uh, finished. And then, you, well, in this case, they do have the stems on. But, um, so, this is a JH Russian factory with a half built canoe on it. And what you can see here is that there's a, a strong back across the top holding everything tight to the mold. And then here, this is a really good example of how you have to shape your planking to make up the difference in the girth of the canoe. But the other thing that makes these things so factory um, amenable is that all the ribs, and apart from in this case, is wide plank, all the ribs are built to the same specification, and all the planking is built to the same specification. So you're not doing any hand thing like you would with a traditional lap straight canoe or, or so forth. And that's where we get to here. So for example, here's a, the milling room of the B.N. Morris factory. And there's a, a table saw on the left, and a planer on the right, uh, running off of a line shaft. You can see the big electric motor on the right hand corner. <laughs> and what they're doing is ripping and thicknessing rib, uh, rib stock. And so a typical rib is two and three eighths inches wide, five sixteenths of an inch thick. And then however long you need it to be to, to go around the, the edge of the canoe. What are the ribs made out of? White cedar. Northern white cedar. And then you're still heating the ribs to make the bend? Yes. Yep. So you have to steam them to, to bake them supple to bend over the form. Yes. And the planking? Uh, depending on the, the time period, either northern white cedar or western red cedar. 
Western Red Cedar became really popular after the 1920s when it was available along clear links from the West Coast. But Western Red Cedar does not bend nearly as well as white cedar. So typically the canoes had white cedar ribs, red cedar planking. And then the, the gunnels, which is the long parts that run end to end, were either if they're local species, it would be spruce, ash, um, pretty, uh, yeah, pretty much spruce, ash, sometimes white oak. Uh, otherwise, on fancy grades, they would use mahogany. Do you, do you know the date of these photos? Uh, definitely before. These, these are probably around 1908, 1906, 1908. Because um, they were published in his catalogs, his trade catalogs, and they didn't, he didn't date those catalogs, but we've tried to work out where they follow the scheme. And um, as I, I'll, I'll get into later, um, we know it's before 1919, definitely before 1919. Again, so another shot of another woodworking room where you can see the big machinery going on. Um, lots of pre-prepared stock. You can see the dogs have a pre pre bent ends on them before they put them on the form. Um, piles of ribs, piles of raw lumber. What was the attraction to building the name? That's just where they, they developed. That's it. That, yeah, um, the, the, the canvas canoe is said to have been developed by a guy named E.H. Garrish in uh, um, oh, Bangor, Maine around 1885. Now the truth is there's probably a lot of people that had their hand in it, people were communicating, people saw other people doing stuff and whatnot, but that's sort of the, <coughs> the, the story. And myself and another friend of mine have done a lot of work trying to figure out whether it really is true or not, and probably it is. The interesting Garish uh, was also a fly rod maker. He was a, he was a guy primarily. So he made fishing rods, and then he started building these canoes. And there was at one point, there was a newspaper article that said, Mr. Garrish won't be building any canoes this year because he has too many orders for fishing rods. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's another shot of uh, uh, the V.M. Morris factory. Again, it's that same time period around 1904 to 1908. And here you can see a number of canoe forms set up that all, all the ones in the back row have, um, most of them have the ribs installed. And one of the things you can see, one of the drawbacks to this system is that for each model of canoe you want to make, for each length, if you have different beams or which are the widths or tongue shapes of the hull, you have to have a unique form for each one of those. So if you're going to offer, let's say, three models in three different lengths, you're talking nine canoe molds. And they often offer far more than, than that. So the, the, the and again, so you can see again up above are the racks with all the gunnels. That made the first long bit that gets back into the mold. And then there'll be a crew of guys in there, and all they're doing is they're spending ribs and uh, onto the molds. Another crew of guys will come in and install the planking. And in the foreground are some boats that they're, they're starting to, to finish up. Another shot of a construction room. This one's a, the Chestnut Canoe Company. <coughs> in uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick. He just not tried to patent the concept of, of canvas covered canoes in 1904, but by then so many people were doing it, they never could defend it. Mm -hmm. So once the canoe comes off of the mold, you have to hold it into shape with these temporary braces until you put the permanent thwarts in. The canoes are typically not planked all the way up on the mold, so you have some finished work to do after it comes off. This one is the, the, the J.R. Robertson factory in Auburndale, Massachusetts. This factory is on the Charles River. We had a canoe livery in addition to the canoe shop. And here you can see the, the canoe mold is just sort of haphazardly tossed over to the side to make room for other projects that they're working on. And the boats just pile up as they're working. Then they go to a finishing room where the outside gunnels are put in, the thwarts, the seats, the press hooks, or, or decks we call them. And this picture, here's, this is, this guy's holding the only tool that's really specialized for building a wood canvas canoe. And it's basically a hunk of iron shaped like a comma with a really curved side and a less curved side, we call it a clinching iron. 
and you hold it up against the inside of the plank and you hammer your tacks in and, and that punches an animal over. The guy on the, the left is obviously posed because there's absolutely no reason he should be using a bit and brace in that. And this came out of a newspaper article about the old time canoe company. <laughs> These are shots from the old town canoe company showing some of the, the finishing steps, the, the, the <coughs> I don't know, it's not really a white belt sander, but it's a sanding machine for sanding the, the seat frames. This guy's running uh, rib stuff to a, a bandsaw because the ribs are tapered as they reach the ends, which um, when you're in the canoe, it gives you the illusion of the canoe being finer in construction than if you left them straight. And the ribs have a tendency to tip towards the middle of the canoe as you're bending them over. So that taper counteracts the, the, that illusion, makes them look like they're going more straight up and down. And then, they're in the hall. I don't think this is OSHA approved. <laughs> big, big belt sander. And <laughs> And then what they're doing is just moving that side of the hall before the canvas goes out. <laughs> and again, another shot of, uh, this is the Russian factory's room for finishing. So the, the, there's the, the B.M. Morris factory again. And we know that this is where they're putting the canoe fill around to the canoes and the bed the canvas stretch around to them. This fellow uh, here is, is Mr. Morris. He shows up in every photograph that's taken of his factory. <laughs> it's easy. You know, it's, it's a number of guys, and they're, basically, they're, they're putting white lead filler on canoes all day long. I don't, don't think many of them had descendants. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of paint did they use? Well, the filler was a combination of, of, of paint and white lead and uh, silica, fine, oh, fine yeah. white silica. Um, I'm trying to remember what the old time recipe calls for. It's like two and a half pounds of white lead in a two gallon recipe. So it's, it's pretty much 50 50 white lead, 50 50 other things make it spreadable. And toxic. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 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 Did they have short lives? Yes. Yeah. I don't know if they had short lives, but um, a lot of them didn't have children. <laughs> Probably also had GI distress from blood poisoning. Yeah. Could be, yeah. I mean, they were, they were applying it, they were sanding it, and obviously the sanding and the silica. Yeah, the silica, the silica too is this guy in New York's lungs as well. So, this is the Old Town Canoe Factory's finishing room. They have actually an overhead a vacuum system so they can vacuum out the halls before they. Um, I'm pretty sure these photos come from the 1940s. The racing, canoe, or racing boat company in Wisconsin also was a big manufacturer of canoes, and this is their finishing room. Yeah. And then what do you do with them when they're done? Well, at the Old Town Canoe Company, they would stack them on the roof. <laughs> and they were, this is where the filler would cure. It would cure filler that with, it's got the linseed oil and the white lead, and all this takes about a month to cure before you can paint it. So they have to store them somewhere, and so they just kept going up and up and up. <laughs> Or in the owner's backyard, <laughs> and this is this is one of the the, um, the owner's sons brushing the snow off the canoes. Huh. How long would it take for them to cure about a month or so? Yeah. So, like I said before, J. H. Rushton was one of the first canoe builders in, in the United States, and he founded his factory in 1875. This is a shot of his factory. It's in Canton, New York, so up in the St. Lawrence River Valley. And I don't know how well you can read this, but this is a diagram of, of how things move through the factory. So on the, on the ground floor, you had the, the storage of the raw materials and the, um, the machines for, for breaking down the raw materials. On the second floor, you had two sections. The one on the upper right is where all the old wood boats were being built, and on the lower left is where the canvas canoes were being built. Now, when Rushton decided in 1901 to build canvas canoes, he did it under, he did it very reluctantly because he was convinced that his all wood cedar <coughs> lap canoes were a far superior method of building canoes. But he finally saw that the writing was on the wall, the marketplace was moving towards canvas canoes. 
So he brought in a canoe builder from Maine that had worked at another, one of the Maine factories to come down and head up his canvas canoe building operation. And then on the third floor, where the third floor is where the paint shop was. So as the canoes were being built, they're going upwards through the factory. And so Rushton died in 1905. His canvas canoe guy um, decided to leave at the same time. His nephew starts running the company. And to run the canvas canoe shop, he hires an outside contractor to come in and build them. The guy's name was Frank Fox. And he would hire a crew of two to four guys to come in with him every winter to build canoes. And his uh, little record book is in the Historical Society in Canton. And it covers the period from December 1908 to April 1912, and it gives us a real good picture of the dynamics of the Rushton Canvas Canoe Manufacturing at that time. Because they would work from December until April. And then, come April, they probably went back to doing whatever it was they were doing in the summertime, like building houses or painting houses or other farming or whatever. Uh, and in the four years that this covers, they built 309 canoes in the first year, 283 the second, 99, and then 80. So production clearly started to go down by 1912. Um, and there was an interesting note that in, on December 30th, they didn't work because Mrs. Rushton died on that day. That's like the only day they, they got off in a long time. Um, I think that's the wrong date. Um, so the Russian company entirely ceased uh, production in 1917, and it's presumably because World War I was starting to happen. Um, the total production that we have been able to guesstimate by recording the serial numbers of all these canoes, because each one had a sequentially numbered uh, serial number stamped on it, is that it was about 5,500 canvas canoes in total, which roughly averages 340 per year. Um, now, uh, after the World War I ended, there was a fellow in Ogdensburg, New York, named Joseph Layer, who was a, a longtime boat builder. During the war, he went out to um, Buffalo to build airplanes with Glenn Curtis, of, of Glenn Curtis, the Curtis airplane thing. And then when he came back, he actually bought up the assets of the Russian canvas canoe molds and started building them around 1920 for a short time. There's only a handful of them out there, and we don't know for how long that took place. Ian Morris, Morris was another one of the early uh, canoe builders. He, he uh, appears to have started building canoes around 1895. He would have been almost like 16 years old at the time. His older brother was a carriage maker, so, um, and he also worked in the factory. The original factory was in their family home in Busy, Maine. And these are a couple of photographs. The, the one on the lower right is one I was fortunate enough to find on eBay. And it shows Ian Morris and his wife on the far right and his crew of workers on the left. They would put the canoes up on the roof to take the glamour shots for for advertisements. <laughs> then he moved to a, a much larger factory, which you can see the, the little building that the, the left front foreground is the main office, and then the rest of it was the factory. Mm -hmm. This is from a, a catalog that's, that was printed around 1917. And in 19, December 15, 1919, the factory burns down. Uh, it was insured for $90,000, and they ended up settling for about $50,000. So apparently we, we suspect that these are some recoverable assets, and there's some evidence that some of his canoe, canoe forms may have survived the fire and were later used by the Kennebec Canoe Company or an Old Town Canoe Company. We know that, the, again, based on serial numbers, we estimate that the total production, actually we know that the production production was 17,200 because some canoes that survived the fire were taken to Old Town Canoe Company and finished there and the, the Old Town records document that. So, so we, we do know that. The Kennebec Canoe Company was in Waterville, Maine. And another a shot of its factory around 1910. They kept records 
of all the canoes they built in these large books that are now in the Maine State Museum. And what they do is they record the serial number of each canoe built, what its length was, what was um, used for the, the woods for the trim, the planking, all that bit. Right on down to the days each of those things was installed, and then uh, what color it was painted, and then where it was shipped to. And so, so if you have a Kennebec canoe and you tell us what the serial number is, we can tell you pretty much all there is to know about it. These have all been digitally scanned and are available through the, w, the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. Based on these records, we can tell what their, their production looks like. Uh, from 1909 to 1941, which is when they ceased production, you can see that after the Depression, they got real, real slow. But in their heyday, which was around, oh, that one here's, um, oh, I thought I had a slide for that. Maybe I have it for all time. Um, so you can see that in their, their heyday, that the red lines are actually the canoes. So that in their, their top production year, producing years, they're producing about 1,500 canoes a year. Um, and they primarily work um, in the winter months? Or no, Canada would be year round. Year -round. Yep, this is a year round factory. Uh, dips uh, just before World War One and so on. If they produced, these produced uh, production in 1941, again, it's probably because of a world war. The factory building is still standing today in this, I think it houses an insurance company or something like that. The Old Town Canoe Company is the oldest canoe company that's still in business today. Uh, they were founded in 1901 in Old Town, Maine, in a small factory building. Um, I think you can see here. The, the tower, in the top left photo, that's the, the city water tower in the background. And in the shot on the left, that's the, the bell tower for the firehouse, which was next door. Over time, they expanded till the, the length of the building running front to back was 290 feet. And there's a railroad siding right alongside. And they would actually trans ship out their canoes by a boxcar load. And in fact, if you ordered a boxcar load of canoes, you got a four-foot display canoe hanging in your shop. And if you ordered two boxcar loads, you got an eight-foot <laughs> display canoe <laughs> hanging in your shop that was painted with gold script and whatnot. The old time. Another shot of the, the factory from a postcard. And then Old Town also kept records of every canoe they built. And these all survived. They're still being held by the, the company, but they're in discussions of getting them transferred to a museum in Maine. Uh, but in the meantime, Benson Gray, who is the descendant, he's the great-grandson of the founders of the Old Town Canoe Company, got permission to go in and take all these cards and scan them, and it has scanned well over 250,000 individual cards. And again, this card shows you who the canoe is shipped to, uh, what the serial number is of the canoe, the, the very specifications, <coughs> like its length, what its grade was, what model it was. Uh, in this case, it's got open spruce tunnels with birch decks, um, and it was shipped with a mast, so it was shipped with a sailing rig, because you can see it has a mast seat and step and a rudder. And then again, all of the dates that the various procedures were done on the canoe. You know, so the half-built date was July what, July 1st, 1924? That's the day the canoe came off of the mold and was assigned its serial number. And of course it was completed. On the same day it was taken off the mold. A couple days later they put oil on it. Um, canvas it on the, let's see, I don't know why they rolled it after. But, um, July 2nd they canvas it, July 3rd they put the first filler on it. And by July 18th it was uh, uh, varnished and fit, uh, painted. And on July 28, 24, it was out the door. Uh, this is what their, their production uh, kind of looks like. You know, see it booming in the 19 teens, tapering off during the Depression, and then sort of a steady increase right up to 1965, which this chart ends at because that's when Old Town also started building fiberglass canoes. They continued to build wood canoes right up until only a few years ago. We take a little uh, peek at what's going on in uh, around the uh, late teens, which is you know during their heyday. You can estimate that they were producing about 15,000 canoes a year. 
which equates to about 3,750 a year or 12 canoes a day. So by 1965, all the, the aluminum and fiberglass were really impacting wood canoes uh, sales across the board. Um, they, they are still in business. They're building plastic kayaks and, and canoes and things like that. Uh, they ceased production in the 2000s. The original factory was torn down in 2014. Uh, it was documented. I don't think it was Habs that documented it. I tried to find out last night and I, and I, could, I couldn't. I, went, I think it was documented by the State of Maine's Historical Preservation. So now uh, Jerry Stelmach, who's a longtime canoe builder, has taken the contract on with, with Old Town to build official Old Town canoes on original Old Town forms. Which leads us to, you know, now, now what's going on. In the 1980s, uh, Jerry Stelmach and, and Roland Thurlow, Thurlow were two uh, young canoe builders up in Maine that had learned from some old timers how to build it, and they decided to share what they know with the wider world and, and wrote a couple of books, which a lot of us young people uh, at the time latched on to and learned how to build canoes. The Wooden Canoe Heritage Association was founded in 1979 by Jeff and Jill Dean. Our current membership is about 1,300 and it's about 30 member builders. Those are the, the members of the association who are either professionally, full-time or part-time building wooden canvas canoes or other all wood canoes. And a lot of these shops are either one or two man operations now, working in small facilities. So the, the, the large shop on the left is Roland Thurlow's shop with his helper Peter and the other person I don't know. The upper right is Alex Cohn teaching a class at the Wooden Canoe Heritage Museum in Wisconsin. And the lower right is a fellow named Tom Seedy who lives in Massachusetts and also is a master leather worker. With that, I'll ask if there's any questions. John. Yes, I am curious to know why uh, the canoe manufacturing took place in the Northeast and out into Wisconsin. What about the South? Were there not canoes produced in the South? Or? Um, but partly it's because that's where the white cedar grows. I know, I know you have Atlantic white cedar down here, but it's not quite the same. But I think it also goes back to this tradition of Maine guiding in the North Woods, using, they're using birch bark canoes primarily. Um, in Maine, it would be for salmon fishing, trout fishing, moose hunting, you know, deer hunting, whatever, in, in New York State, same sort of thing. Uh, with the Adirondack Mountains, and in, because our waterways typically tend to be small and windy with lots of carries, we want a lightweight craft to, to do that, um, move them around because you're often carrying them on your shoulders as much as you're paddling them on the water. Um, and, and yeah, so I think that that's probably primarily why. Because because uh, remember, the, the wood canvas canoe is an offshoot of the birch bark canoe. And birch bark only grows yeah. up, only down south so far. And so the canvas canoe was, was you know, you take the birch bark canoe, start patching it with canvas, start replacing the bark the canvas, and then come up with a new way of building canoes fast quick, uh, and re re reproducibly the same so that you can standardize parts. Like we were talking to somebody last night or this morning about standardized parts. You grab any rib off the pile and pop it in. Um, and which reminds me of another point that um, these canoes, every single part or piece can be taken out and replaced, repaired, or whatever. So the canoe, to, to can, the canvas is easily replaced. So if you're taking care of it, it's got an infinite lifespan. Yeah. Well, I think they also have to be lightweight because yeah. through the Adirondacks, you right. go yeah. from lake to lake to yep. lake. Yeah. But you have to carry it. That's right. Yeah. How are they sealed inside with polyurethane or something? Like nope, that? a traditional spar varnish. So you want a, you want a oil based spar varnish. Is there a front of this? Um, only in so much as how your seats are located because the bow seat will be set further <coughs> towards the center of the canoe and the stern seat will be tucked up right at the end. Okay. But if you're paddling solo, you often sit in this bow seat facing rearwards or sit in the middle of the canoe, it doesn't matter. But, so, but it doesn't matter until you install the seats. Yeah, they're, they're typically symmetrical at that. Then do you have another one? 
Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, I had a, had a friend that was a uh, canoe racer. He had Kevlar canoe, mm -hmm. which weighed practically nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't recall that there were any structure inside of it. No, it's, it's the, the Kevlar, or in, you know, it's the Kevlar, any of the glass fiber, fiberglass, um, Kevlar, or whatever. The mm -hmm. stru structure is the fabric which is saturated with epoxies or vinyl ester resins or things like that. But they don't, they, they might have stiffeners in some of the, and especially the earlier ones before they figured out some of the ways of working with glass. <coughs> you know, very full of but wet from the canvas canoes are good for wet water too. <laughs> but don't they break when you have them off? Yeah. Well, you know, the, these canoes, remember, they, especially in Canada, they were being used for exploration of these wilderness rivers and whatnot. And so oftentimes you didn't have a, a choice but to take your gear down to a rapid. What typically happens is that if you tear the canvas, you've got a, a repair kit with you that you can just patch the hole in the canvas and carry it underway. If you hit something hard enough to break planking or ribs, it often doesn't tear the canvas. And so you just sort of push things back out and maybe run a field patch and carry right on until you get out of the bush and then you can take those out and put in new ones. So it, it's, they're, they're, um, they're very durable to begin with. So it takes a lot to damage one. Um, rebar in a river is, your, is a bigger damage than any, that's more damage than anything else, for example. But, um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, they explored a lot of rivers with canvas canoes over the years. Yeah. And does your organization include and recognize the birch bark canoe makers? Oh yeah. Yep. Because yep. there's still people doing that. Oh yeah. Well, I, one, of, one of my good friends is a, a bark canoe maker in Wisconsin, and he makes as good of birch bark canoe as anybody ever did. Uh, yeah, if you want to go look, look up a guy named Ferdy Good on the web, he's uh, very active on various social medias and stuff. A few years ago, we went to Plymouth and we saw them reproducing a uh, a dugout canoe. Yeah. Is there a wooden uh, kayak group also? Not a formal one. Um, there are some people that make wooden kayaks that come to our wooden canoe association's assembly. We don't chase them away. <laughs> um, typically wooden kayaks, well, if you're talking about traditional ones, they would be you know, built with willow saplings and whatnot, and then seal skins or walrus skins and, and whatnot, the, the Lucian Bidericas or Greenland kayaks, for example. Nowadays, most people are either, you know, they're, they're replicating that or they're building the plywood sea kayaks from kits or things like that. But, yeah. What about the uh, aluminum canoes that we all buy to camp? Well, that, that's what pretty much caused the demise of wood canoes in general. Um, <laughs> once, once we're, see, wars are a period of great innovation. And so aluminum was really came into use during World War II in fabricating airplane parts. Oh. And when the war ended, these aluminum companies had to figure out what to do because they weren't making so many airplanes anymore. One of the things was the Grumman Company shaped them into the form of a canoe. Mm -hmm. And that was the first aluminum canoe, was the Grumman's in 1942, or 45-ish, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and then, of course, no maintenance required. You drag it across the ground, you leave it in the backyard all winter long, and right. it's pretty soon, the, the, that was the beginning of the end, really, for wood canoes apart from aficionados. That, so who's making them now? What's that? Huh? Who's, who's making them now? Mm -hmm. um, I just heard that, uh, to see, when Grumman closed, a group of people bought them out and founded the Marathon Canoe Company. They closed, and I think some people just, or some former employees are reopening it recently, but that's, I think there's another one out in, in the Midwest, like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like Coleman, and oh, yeah. Mad River, and so those are so common now. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And they're, they're Almost as light as the aluminum, and they don't make that go. Oh, you, know, you, you can get you know, Kevlar canoes that, that weigh ounces. Yeah. And, I mean, aluminum, aluminum is, is heavy for it's, it's, it's up in the middle. But it, it's, it's, um, the hull shape is really determined by the materials we're working in. And so some canoes that are made of certain materials can never see a particular shape, and it does, yeah. you can't form the wood that way. Mm -hmm. 